on behalf of the Public Policy Center, who's been a proud uh, co-sponsor of this event for 21 years. We would like to thank Dean Button and the College of Arts and Sciences for their strong support of this seminar in dealing with very challenging topics that uh, face our communities on a daily basis. We uh, are proud to help facilitate bringing uh, national speakers of stature to help inform our communities and our university uh, about strategies for addressing challenging issues. We're here today to note that while most people are not inherently prone to violence, targeted violence has been a very challenging issue for our communities. We um, are bringing together a panel looking at various levels of community, of community violence from the national governmental level, from the corporate workplace level and the local level to think about ways we can harmonize our efforts and come together as a community to address these issues. I wanna flesh this out in a few moments, but a few housekeeping notes. We have people joining us here live as well as online. Um, if you have questions for the panel, please type those into the Q&A for those of you online. Those of us here present, please write them down. Um, please put your name down if you're here presently so we know to follow up with you if there are any who to follow up with with the question. Uh, at the conclusion of the panel event, we'll have time for additional questions or if members of the media are present, some of our panel members may be able to uh, address your questions. Uh, let's flesh this issue out a little more. When we think about targeted violence, some of the issues around, for example, terrorism, thinking back to the 90s and the Oklahoma City bombing, thinking about events where there have been mass shootings. We, we had to spend a lot of our time thinking about how to have people see something and say something. A laudable goal and an important goal. Much of our earlier strategy came off the heels of situations like Oklahoma City and 9-11. And understandably, we're focusing on a type of risk and threat. What we have learned is that targeted violence can take on many forms and affect us in very different parts of our communities, such as our workplaces, our universities, our schools, even our bowling alleys, as recent events would highlight. There was a recent graphic that uh, was just released by the BBC looking at uh, mass violence incidents, and that's defined by the FBI as four or more fatalities and within the given event. There were over 550 events in the U.S. just by this at, at presently. That is a significant increase from even the previous year. We know that we have to take a creative approach to this. And we recognize that there are other issues such as mental illness, guns, other areas of violence prevention we need to think about, which by themselves could take up the whole time. We're here to talk about some interesting behaviorally based, community based models that have shown some success and help maybe spur some more conversation. It is my pleasure to introduce some of today's panel. I'll introduce each of them before they speak. First of all, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Lynn Van Mail. She has 24 years of experience implementing targeted violence prevention, uh, especially within healthcare settings. She is assistant professor of psychology at Uni Oregon Health and Science University. She is a currently now senior director of threat management for a national security service for a rather large U.S. multi-state healthcare organization. She's speaking on her personal behalf. 
hence not mentioning the name of such organization. She previously basically helped set up the workplace violence prevention from one of the world's most, the largest and comprehensive healthcare organizations, the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System. And she has helped develop the practice standards for workplace violence within healthcare settings uh, over the past several years. She, in addition to her visionary work, she has shown leadership within professional organizations. Just recently ended her service on the national board of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. She is also a contributing editor to the Journal of Threat Assessment and Management. That is the shortened version of some of her accomplishments. Needless to say, we are very pleased to introduce Dr. Lynn Van Mail. The live spot on the. Oh. There it is. There we are. We're working now. If I stand here, are we still within the mic range? Excellent. Thank you so very much for having me here. As Dr. Sklora very graciously said, um, I am here on my own time and dime. These are my own words, and I needed to make sure that we didn't have any conflicts of interest and shared with you that. Yes, these are indeed some of my other roles, opportunities, and responsibilities. And I really do like coming to Nebraska and collaborating with you as my vacation. So thank you all very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to get to be here. Let's go ahead and get started with, um, are people able to read through? We've got this screen share issue coming up here. Can you still see the, the title slides through the, okay. so. The question is, is this person going to become violent, is what we're often approached with. That's the challenge that we face. Well, let me pull out my crystal ball. Um, you got this? It just clicked. You're fine. Are we good? What are you doing now? Sorry, I, I'm aware that the slides will be difficult to read through the... Um, the screen sharing graphic that at least is down there at the bottom is fine. Thank you very much, Quinn. I appreciate that. And I'm still picking up a little bit of feedback. Are you all hearing that as well? Are you fine? Okay, good. All right. So the question that comes up to us then is, is this person going to be violent? And no, great. Let's go ahead and get out your crystal ball. It's not working. I have this be on my foot. Now we're there. We are miserable at predicting first offense. There's no science, no literature that says we're any good at this. Like, great, pull out your crystal ball and say, is this person gonna be violent versus this person? Well, once we start to get behavior that's in front of us that we can look for some certain behavioral cues, we can do a better job, but predicting a first offense, the literature doesn't have it for us. We're not there which is probably not a bad thing, right? Because that then leads us into really ugly attempts at profiling and statistical analysis off of people preemptively that we cannot support, that we do not have the science to be able to do that. And that level of bias introduced into our society is the opposite direction of what we want to do. So we want to be sure that when we are taking a look at a situation in front of us, we're really looking at the behavior that is there and not trying to predict whether or not someone is going to become violent. What we want to be doing, please, is asking, does this person's behavior in front of us right now pose a safety threat? If we have a behavior that we can look at, then we can start to do the analysis of whether or not this concerning behavior is escalating up a pathway towards violence. And is there anything we can do to put protective factors in the mix with the risk factors so that we can turn that person around? That's what we're hoping to do with this entire work, right? So over here, I specifically chose this picture because one protective factor, one big rock, can balance out lots and lots and lots and lots of little risk factors that pile up. What we tend to see happening, unfortunately, is that people, when they see something and they say something, they see one risk factor 
And we need to get into the mix to understand if there's other risk factors and if there are protective factors. Because if we can get a protective factor wrapped around someone's life, we can turn them around and not have that be a part of their future. They stay safer, we stay safer. That is the goal of behavioral threat assessment. So does the person pose a threat? We ask ourselves a threat of what, right? Is this person at risk of um, breaking things, crashing things, being a, a destruction in the environment? Are they posing a threat of creating a, an explosive device? Then we need to be prepared for our buildings and our personnel. Or is this person posing a safety threat to a specific and targeted individual? By the way, for any of you familiar with firearm safety, the only person this person is posing a threat to is their own butt because they have their finger inside the trigger guard as they're trying to pull this weapon. So they're gonna shoot themselves before they shoot anybody else. So that's the good news here. They pose a threat to themselves, not to somebody else, right? So do they pose a threat of what? Toward whom? Who's in the crosshair? Is it the building? Is it a specific targeted individual? Is it a group of people? Is it an aspect of our culture or society? Is it a house of worship? What is the target? A threat of what? Towards whom? Under what conditions? The same risk of violence put into different contexts can pose a different kind of threat. So we need to look at the big picture, not just what the individual is doing, but what they're doing in the real time in the moment. And different contexts can actually pull for different kinds of threat. So let's do this behavioral threat assessment and management thing so that we can get out and find it. What is that? Well, this is an example document. There are numerous ones that are in publication right now. This is the 2017 publication by the FBI, Making Prevention a Reality, and this is how they define it. This is how we have defined behavioral threat assessment and management. I'm not going to read all of that to you, but the bottom line is that it's a process that combines expertise and knowledge from the literature with expertise of operational implementation to disrupt and understand the attack planning of an individual and keep them from going down that pathway. And the most effective way that we can do that is by putting protective factors in their life. And so what we're talking about is trying to understand the individual and what we can do in that person's case to not have them progress towards attack. That's the purpose of behavioral threat assessment and management. Some key features that I wanted to highlight about this process. Order of operations matters. As people get started in this work, they hear about a threat, they hear about a behavior that concerns them, and the risk is that they put the cart before the horse, is that they want to jump to managing that situation before they've done a proper assessment. If you do a thorough and well-informed assessment, you'll be in a much better place of managing that risk because you'll understand what it actually is a threat posed of what, towards whom, under what conditions. So learn about the situation first before jumping to automatic action with the invitation on the table. Does this situation pose a threat? Right? We've got some dots. Someone tells us about something they've seen. There's a saying that you have to collect the dots before you can connect them. And as we do this work in K through 12 schools, I thought I would pay homage to the K through 12 time honored tradition of the connect the dots, right? So do we have a thing that poses a threat? We've got some dots that we've collected. We don't know. We go to jumping to manage the situation. Do you know what you're managing yet? Well, let's go back around and let's reach out to some of our partners and let's find out some more dots. Do we know what we got yet? How about if we go back around and we collect some more dots? And maybe some more dots. Do we start to see something emerging? Is this a threat? We've got some guesses going down down here. I think it's a this. No, I say it's a that, right? And that's exactly what happens on a threat management team. On a behavioral threat assessment and management team, we will say, we think we've got a hunter. This is a person who is going towards some targeted violence. Other people are like, no, they're just howling. They're just making a lot of noise. This is what they always do. Is it a this? Is it a that? What are we going to do with it? Do you know what it is yet? An octopus. Now the next question is, is it a happy octopus or an unhappy octopus? Is it an octopus? You know what it is now? It's an octopus. 
but is it an octopus that poses a threat? In this case, no, it's a happy octopus, right? This one is not, but you had to collect all those dots first before you knew how to manage the fact that this is a happy octopus, not a threatening octopus, right? Collect the dots before you connect the dots because one size does not fit all. Everyone who starts this work, myself included, 24 odd years ago, right? I wanted the formula. Give me the formula so that when I know that I have a behavior in front of me that is of concern and it poses a level of threat, I know what to do with it so that everybody will stay safe all the time and I will be right and no one will get hurt. It's what I want. Everybody still wants it. It does not exist. Here's our current state of the science. We have a lot of good things that we know about at the case study level of what it is we can do with some situations that will really help them. But there's no universal, if of this, then do that. That's gonna work in every single case because of context, right? Because even when you know you've got an octopus, you don't know if you've got a happy octopus or a sad octopus or an angry octopus, right? Got an octopus. So every time I have an octopus, I do this, not necessarily, you can get ourselves, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble if we try to do that. Our strategy with behavioral threat assessment and management as a multidisciplinary team is to understand what are the circumstances and the situation around which this person is in greatest risk of posing a threat to others. Like, what are those circumstances? What can we do as a team to put together a plan that is individualized, that puts protective factors into their life, takes risk factors away that they themselves are willing to stick to. We can come up with a brilliant strategy and the person says, yeah, no, I'm not gonna play a game with you. I'm not in. You may as well not have a strategy at all. So how can we involve people in the strategies that will help to keep them safe as we, as we uh, develop them? We're in the safety business, not the justice business, not the accountability business, not the punishment business, our goal is to make sure that people stay safe, that we disrupt pathways of targeted violence and that people don't get hurt. You've got to remember that what might be an island today can change when the tide goes out. And suddenly your plan for how to handle a flooded space is now gonna have to shift because you've got easy access now. Context will change. People will go from K through 12 into higher ed. They will go from higher ed into their communities. They will go from their communities into healthcare, into jobs. They will have all sorts of different places that they will be in our society. How are we as a society going to handle keeping everyone safe in those spaces? There's no such thing as once and done. It doesn't happen. We don't just say, oh, did a threat assessment, brush our hands, cool, we're finished. We know that person doesn't pose a threat today. And that snapshot moment in time means you're gonna walk that loop around and the next time around, you might be upside down. And then we have to handle it that way at that time, all right? Some last thoughts before we hand this off. Threat assessment and management must be done as a team. Look at how much space there is around you that something can slide by if you do this by yourself. Right? I don't like that amount of risk and vulnerability, and I'm not keeping anybody safe if I try to do this by myself. So I better know some friends. I better have some departmental relationships already built up with the folks that are in the high risk area in this workplace, with the administrators, with the school counselors, with the behaviorists in the community. I might want to know my friends in federal government and in state and local law enforcement. I might want to know where different people are who can help me collect those dots to help me understand what kind of an octopus I've got. And if they're all trained in behavioral threat assessment and management, they can feed information in, I can feed information out. They're all trained, they can go around with one another and together we weave the opportunity for a safety net. Much less gets past us now. We're in a much better space to be able to capture things and address them at the earliest possible moments to turn them around and de-escalate a situation. Take this one team. Imagine, if you will, for me, shrinking this team down and then building this team across different parts of our society so that these teams in different areas can then talk with one another, through one another, 
collaborate. And this way, when we get everyone who's currently using behavioral threat assessment and management on the same page in the same way, we can have healthcare, K through 12, higher ed, private schools, workplaces, houses of worship, federal, state, and local governments all pulling together in the same way that we are all thinking about threat assessment and mitigation and management in a, in a positive way. These teams have got to stay, uh, uh, they've got to stay calibrated. They need to stay trained and caught up with evidence-based best practice. And one of the best ways to do that is to be able to join and connect and to network with one another so that we're all staying current and sharing the literature. So thank you for your interest in this area. The high level overview of behavioral threat assessment and management teams. And I want to pass it off to our next speaker. Oh. No. A couple points to bridge this. When we've looked at situations that have gone badly, there are often bystanders who saw warning signs. What we've learned is that people are sometimes hesitant because one, everything we observe does not mean violence. Everybody we observe is not necessarily the next shooter, the next bomber, quite the opposite. What we have learned is that when we approach things with an ethic of care, protective factors means how do we get people assistance when they're in trouble so that things don't escalate to a bad place. And a bad place doesn't always mean targeted violence. It may mean other things. How do we start with an ethic of care? How do we start with a prevention mindset and start with a mindset when things are problematic we don't assume somebody is the next fill-in-the-blank shooter, whatever. The Department of Homeland Security has been retooling their approach to targeted violence and has been, uh, uh, been acculturating more of a public health strategy to address that. And it is my pleasure to introduce Bruno Diaz, Bruno is an associate director. I have to read this out loud because it's quite the title. It is associate director for field operations for the central and Midwest regions for the Department of Homeland Security. He's with the Center of Prevention Programs and Partnerships. The department is looking at how do we engage in more preventative activity in a more proactive, pro-social way before working with DHS, Bruno worked for public school districts in Texas related to threat assessment activity and violence prevention initiatives. He worked leveraging programming with multidisciplinary groups such as social workers, mental health professionals, parents, and other community members to help support students. Before doing K through 12 safety programming, he worked, he managed corporate security in workplace violence prevention for a Fortune 10 company. He also worked in public safety, uh, uh, dealing with issues related to different types of violence, such as homicide and gang violence. Bruno is a certified threat manager, graduate of the FBI National Academy, a board certified threat assessment, and, and is board certified investigator holds multiple certifications in behavioral threat assessment and management. He has a master's in criminal justice and MA from the Naval Postgraduate School in Homeland Defense and Security Studies. He's also a graduate student in his spare time. I mean, a doctoral student in his spare time, Bruno Diaz. Thank you, Mario. My mom wrote that bio and she's going to be happy to know that you read the entire thing. So thank like you. That, yes, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. As uh, Mario stated, I work for the uh, Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, and I'm really honored to talk to you a little bit more about our mission um, and how we're approaching prevention. First, I want to start by saying people don't wake up one day, uh, or I, I would go even further back. People are not born terrorists or mass shooters. Right? There's a psychological journey that takes place in which people find that violence is acceptable. Right, And as Lynn and Mario stated, as, as they embark on that journey, there are detectable warning behaviors, warning signs that um, are apparent to people around us. 
you've heard about these strategies from very broad levels, trying to take it down to a community level. We, um, Bruno, for example, mentioned the uptick in hate crime activity, bias activity, which has been very significant, particularly over the last few weeks. Many of these things filter down at different key parts of our communities. Uh, when we think about preventing violence, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna to try to move this so it makes less of a feedback noise here, apologies. We have to think a lot about school safety and schools are having to manage safety at a, at a variety of levels. To speak to that, I'm very pleased to introduce Joe Wright. He is Director of Security for Lincoln Public Schools. He is responsible for leading the district safety and security to create safe environments in all district buildings. In 2013, he created a threat assessment program for the district that was aimed specifically at violence prevention. He is an associate of threat assessment professional certified threat manager. Prior to that work, Joe was very active in violence prevention in the community. Uh, as a police officer, he ultimately retired at the rank of captain, but prior to his retirement, did a lot of prevention oriented work and engagement with various partnerships related to uh, behavioral wellness, mental illness, and looking at implementing in partnership actually with the Public Policy Center, the Behavioral Threat Assessment Program, which we now call BETA, which implemented behavioral threat assessment at a local level across a range of officers, looking at alternatives for diffusing and de-escalating potentially violent situations. My pleasure to introduce Joe Wright. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, we've heard people talk from pretty high level, pretty high altitude today. And so what I wanted to do to, to grab a local flavor was to tell a story about what's happened in Lincoln starting in 2018 on how we've tried to create our violence prevention capacity. So there's a date up there, March 26, 2018. If you remember on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2018, that's when the Parkland tragedy occurred. And much like Sandy Hook, much like Uvalde, some tragedies gain a lot more traction or they affect communities a lot more. And Parkland really was a knockout blow all across the country. And Obviously, I wasn't affected by it, other than just seeing it on the news and thinking about the kids here in town. But it was really one of those ones that caught a lot of traction and Lincoln blew up. And how are we gonna keep our kids safe? And if you remember, as, as the details of Parkland came out, people got more and more upset. It became a national question. What are we gonna do about this? And along the way, if you remember the school resource officer whose responsibility was to be there and part of the SRO's job is to be a guardian, um, some would say he failed at his job. This was all at a time when there was a lot of other talk about should we have officers in schools. To some people, a police officer is a guardian. To others, it is literally their historical oppressor. And how, how are some kids supposed to learn how to conjugate um, a fr irregular French noun if they have to walk by a cop right before they walk in the classroom? That's a legitimate discussion. So the concept of SROs was in the air when that happened. And when Parkland happened, the question was, do we need more SROs in our schools? In Lincoln, we have one SRO in every high school. We don't have any in the middle schools at this time, none in the elementary schools. That came into play right away. Also, um, what was in play at the time in our community, remember this is a local discussion, was there was a big push to increase our, our community learning centers. And th that's an after-school program in about half of our schools, our Title I schools, where kids receive extra services. Big push for that to happen. And also at this time, uh, people were starting to get to know a little bit, people to know that we had an active 
threat management program at Lincoln Public Schools. It's a little bit wonky. A lot of people in the public don't know about threat management, what it is, but the people who need to know knew. So in March 26, 2018, in Lincoln, locally, some gangsters were rolling by uh, each other and decided to shoot out, and, and one got killed. One uh, human being was killed in the shootout, and it happened within a baseball's throw of an elementary school. The parents of that school, other parents pulled in and realized this is when Parkland was raging. Now we have people being murdered right outside our schools. We don't have SROs there. How do we keep our kids safe? And Lincoln pretty much erupted into how are we going to keep our kids safe? So just a reminder, we have a, a school resource officer program in place. We have one in each high school. We used to have school resource officers in the middle schools, but we don't have enough officers to do that. Lincoln has a very small number of police officers, about one per thousand. Most cities have 1.8 to 2.2 per thousand. We have about 300 officers. To get to where we should be on the low end, we would have to hire 80 officers today. And if you can think of how hard it is to find police officers, it's like school teachers, can't find them. But we had a good school resource officer going program going People wanted to increase that. And as I said, that was very problematic. The community wasn't sure they wanted to do that. There's a lot of pushback on SROs. We had a very strong community learning center program in place. Think of where kids can stay after school, get extra lessons. A lot of kids get an extra meal there. A lot of kids in our town eat three meals at school, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, they can get some other services as well. There'd been a long push to get our community learning centers increased and, and bolstered in our community, but that couldn't get any political traction. And we also had a good threat management program going on. I use this because that's not a standard threat management graphic, that's an educational graphic. And when we talk to educators about what threat management is, educators already know about behavior. We have kids with behavior we need to manage. Tier one is all of our kids, we, we, we manage their behavior with strategies. Target intervention for other kids, group, group issues, things like that. But a very small tip of the pyramid group of kids, one to two, three percent need individualized safety plans. Individualized safety plans for behavior. You can sell that to an educator. Now we just say, well, it's, it's a behavior you haven't heard of very often. It's called direct violence. We can sell it that way. We try to un, unpolice it, unmilitarize it, uncomfortable. So we had a good threat management. Those three things were already in place and they all could stand a little improvement. So that's those were the three things that were in place when our community got together and decided that our three goals were to protect students from reasonably perceived risks. This, these were three huge community meetings that, brought, that boiled down to these three goals. Prepare students for greater academic and personal success and prevent risk to students where possible. Now, again, it's local. Politics are local. Huge concerns about creating a JPA that had taxing authority, things like that. But what our very wise community leaders put together, our school board members and our city council members was an interlocal agreement, very non-threatening. Unless the city and the school district wanted to move forward, nothing could happen. Had a board created. Everybody kind of kept their own money. We weren't gonna tax anybody. But our, our politicians really came through. I put the faces of a couple up there. This is our mayor, Larry Gaylor Baird, and our recently retired school superintendent, Steve Joel. I give them personally a lot of credit, not only because they were with our other community leaders when this was created, but because they were the leaders of the city and the school district for the first two years while this interlocal took off when it was most vulnerable. They kept it alive. So who protects students? Who plays that guardian role in school? That's an SRO. How do we prepare students for greater academic and personal success outside of the regular school day? That's a CLC, a community learning center. And how do we prevent risk to students when we can't? That's a threat management program. So here's what we did. Even though a lot of people push back on it, we added uh, school resource officers to our middle schools. But to do that, we had to guarantee, guarantee people we would be absolutely transparent with all of our data to make sure that people could see our SROs were not getting involved in student discipline. They were not arresting 
for things that shouldn't be arrested for, shouldn't be, shouldn't be a crime. We put out a 94 page report on this the last time. We do a report every year, 94 pages of raw statistics so everyone could see exactly what we're doing. I just grabbed one. I didn't think you'd want to see all 94 pages. But if you look to this uh, little officer graph over here, think of, of the times officers arrest someone at school, a student, a referrer, we call it, because they're juveniles. How many times does the officer initiate that arrest? How many times are they out proactively looking for trouble and find a kid and arrest them? 3% of the time. There's some other other statistics here that I think are important too. How many how many kids, we have 42,000 kids. How many did our SROs take into custody and lodge in our juvenile detention center last year? Out of 42,000, two. The year before, two out of 42,000. Those are good numbers. We want to keep those up. We should we put these numbers out every year for everyone to see. We put out the raw data so people can look at their own disparity work um, and do their own disparity work so they can look for um, um, racial and ethnic disparity calculation. Expulsion and suspension data. So we can compare that discipline data with the arrest data of the SRO. Uh, Dr. Gundy uh, did a lot of study of what we do here to write her dissertation on the value of trauma-capable training for police officers and their partners when dealing with people uh, who are in a crisis or might be dangerous. Um, that goes to a class called, called BETA that Mario talked about that all of our SROs, all of our SWAT team members, a lot of other people have to take to stay in the department. And that training is delivered in the BETA course, which Dr. Bowling uh, kicked off 15 years ago, I think she saw this train coming before anybody else did and said, we need to find a way to get better outcomes when law enforcement are working with people who are in crisis and maybe danger. And lastly, uh, Dr. Scalora on the Monday after Sandy Hook was in Dr. Joel's office at the uh, district office building at Lincoln Public Schools, explaining to him how a threat management program can meet the culture of Lincoln Public Schools and not turn it into a, a camp where we send kids away, where we lock kids up. It's where we can surround kids with resources and make them safe and successful. So that happened here at Lincoln. I can think it happened a lot of other places too. I think we got lucky, but we have a lot of help from the people that we see there. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to try to move the mic around and hopefully we won't have any technical issues. Thank you. Um, let me just throw out a few questions. Let's start with, first of all, from your perspectives, you've all approached this from different levels. You've all worked at a local level and tried to apply these things systematically. What um, what have you found some of the challenges to be in implementing your work minus money, right? What what might be some of the challenges you've had to try to address? Please, Dr. Van Mail. Thank you. Um, whenever we've started these programs in any organization, we've usually had about six filters that we have to take a look through, the lenses of how we're going to um, sell this and operate it effectively and ethically. So number one, because I'm a clinician, I need to look at things that are clinical. What is the clinical implication of what we're doing? Does this make sense from a health, from a mental health perspective, this program that we're going to do? Number two, what are the legal implications? I think uh, Mr. Diaz was mentioning, how can we legally obtain the information that we need given the different laws of information sharing? So what's the legal implication for this? Then we've got the ethics that we hopefully are always keeping our compass pointing north on the ethics of this work that will then drive some of the political things that we have to consider. What are the larger, literally political, like do you have to answer to Congress? Are you a federal organization with federal funding that you need to answer to the taxpayers, to the state and local taxpayers? What are the politics of your own institution? K through 12 and higher ed have no politics at all, right? None. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Healthcare has politics. Churches, houses of worship have politics in place. Then we need to pass it through what the optics are. You may have great clinical, legal, um, ethical, and uh, political drivers, but if your optics of what you're doing don't meet your community's expectations, you're going to have a hard time actually getting some implementation and then financial, which was off the table. But it's still a major driver. So any one of those areas, we're constantly taking a look at how to get these programs to play through those lenses so that we have support and buy-in when we actually implement. Thank you, please. I'll, I'll piggyback. I, I think you touched on something that's really critical. And I'll, I'll go back to my days working, uh, doing the amazing work that Joe does. Not quite as amazing, but similar. Uh, working in the K-12 sector. Um, I encountered resistance and talking about the optics, the name behavior title, behavioral threat assessment can be off-putting, right? But by having a really well-defined support system in place, I got parents to see that their their children weren't being subjected to subjected to behavioral threat assessment and management they were becoming beneficiaries of additional resources and support systems that were intended to make them successful so uh overcoming the optics i think can be done by having meaningful programs and, and well-defined strategies that really align resources with the risks that you're identifying and uh, this is a captain obvious answer, but I think uh, over time, as we become more politicized, you know, a lot of people only watch one news channel and and not any of the others, and that that's on either side of the, the spectrum. But uh, school board meetings now can be pretty vicious places where it's a it's a public square to come, say whatever you want, and not to talk about the need for more diff math classes or more slots in the marching band. Uh, public schools become a pretty pretty terrible place sometimes for people who generally, a lot of times, most people come to our school board meetings uh, don't have kids in the school system. And that's it's become very divisive. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. What, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about your successes. For example, um, First of all, how do you guys conceptualize success? How do you know when you're being successful? And I know prevention is hard to sometimes articulate, but you're in the prevention business, so you've thought about it some. And we sort of warned you, you might talk about it. Um, how, how do you operationalize it, conceptualize it? If I had another uh, slide opportunity, there's a great graphic that really depicts this this issue, this need. Um, I want the base rate of reporting to go up. That's how I know I'm successful. And that seems counterintuitive because I'm asking for money, I'm asking for resources. I'm gonna say, I'm giving you the optics and the data to show you that what we're doing is effective. People want to see the base rate of violence go down. And what will happen instead is that our success, if we're doing it right, is going to skyrocket the number of reports that we get. And within that, success looks like a change in the ratio of what you're being told about. So you want to get more. If you think about one in five events are usually reported, one in five, I can tell you all about the research of how we get that, but there's about one in five, and it's in a universal phenomenon across sectors. If you know 20% of what is happening, and then tomorrow, next year, you double that. And people say, what just happened? You doubled the amount of violence with your program? Now we know 40% of what's actually happening. And we're going to triple it, and then we'll still only know 60% of what's happening. You want that five-fold increase to finally think that you're being told about everything that's being happening, that's going on. And then within that, you want a big ratio of all the verbal, the ideation, the grievance level stuff. And then some where you actually caught it at re research and planning and preparation. And then some of those are still going to be your breaches and your attacks. But if you can get the ratio of those to go down, within the rest of your data skyrocketing, it means that you're being effective. So there's some really nice things to think about wanting more reports as opposed to wanting them to go away. Thank you. 
please. Yeah, from from uh, within my role uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, I think uh, a key measure uh, is the development of the state strategies that I mentioned during my presentation, where states are recognizing that just like you can develop procedures to prevent uh, flooding or fires, you can develop mechanisms and put things in place that rather than being reactive, um, is practice about violence prevention. So I think it's a that is a monumental uh, way of measuring uh, the impact of CP3 in the prevention space. I'll share with this group at a personal level, I was someone who faced many risk factors. I faced extreme poverty, language barriers, lost my father at a very young age. What turned me around from being an angry young adult was one teacher paying attention to me. Mr. Manza, he was my US history teacher. Complete shift, uh, light and darkness. So I, I'm, I'm a believer because I'm a case study of that. Um, so yeah, I thank you. I, I think it's really important. That's cool. It's nice to hear some people like history too. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Thank you, Bruno. <laughs> Uh, I would concur with Lynn and maybe mention just uh, we measure obviously the reporting we get of threat concerns, but uh, we also monitor our administrators at each of the buildings, what kind of help they're asking for. And we get, even now, we get increasing asks from our principals and our social principals and coordinators, even if it's say, I just want to let you know. Um, and, it, you know, oftentimes when we go to meetings, I'll just say, everybody raise your hand if you've talked to someone in our office in the past week. And we just get a tremendous amount of internal reporting. And I think that's because people trust the processes that we put together. Thank you, Mario. And they've, they've stood the test of time. We've been there over 10 years now. So how do y'all, um, we got a question from over there. How do y'all get, how do you try to engage stakeholders, getting people to come forward, because there is a lot of reticence, right? People don't want to snitch. There are trust issues. People don't know how this may work. We, we talk out loud a lot about trying to help, but help people, but how, what are some strategies y'all have contemplated to get people to engage more with prevention? It's been a lot of fun to go around to the high risk areas. If, you're, if we're tracking our data and we know where we've got schools that are having a hard time, we know where there are workplaces in a hospital that are having particular difficult times. One of the strategies we've had to engage people is to be on boots on the ground with them and to go out into the space and to be present and to say, tell me about your pain points, show me what's going on. How can we hear from you about your story and have your skin in the game to be able to create the solution? So that then when we write policy, then when we put programs out, we've actually got stakeholders who were there in the moment creating the solution with us. So we go to our highest risk areas and we roll up our sleeves and we have a real conversation with real people. It's worth the time it takes to do proper full discovery because people tend to support what they themselves create. If we created it for them and either spoon feed or force feed it, it's gonna get spit back up. Right. So what is it that you actually want and how can we then make sure that what you want is aligned with an evidence-based best practice that's going to keep you on the road towards making sure we're doing this right and well and safely? Yeah, so um, training, I think, is a big piece. Uh, people often talk about how they can be impacted by violence and through training and awareness, we can talk to them about how they too can impact violence, right? Uh, they can be a force for good. I saw that happen in the K-12 sector when I directed threat assessment and management. Initially, when we launched our program, uh, resources were being allocated after a threat or threatening behavior. There was a growth, like a maturity that took place where uh, our staff, because they felt empowered, they felt like they could change things. They started paying attention to why is this kid alone in the cafeteria? Why is this attendance so bad? And resources were being allocated very early. You no longer needed a threat. You were trying to take care of things early on. And that came through training awareness and seeing positive outcomes from the work that we we're doing. 
Uh, as you can tell, we like data. We pull a lot of data, as much data as we can. And then if you remember that set of photos of people that use our data, none of those people work or, or examine our data. None of those people work for the police department, work for the city, or work for the school district. And when our public sees that we push out that much data, raw data, everyone can see it, and outsiders evaluate it for us, I think that gives us legitimacy and lets us stay alive. Thank you. We we had one question and with different issues because there's a tension between getting reports and we have things out there like see something, say something. Lincoln Public Schools has safe to say, correct? That, that rolls out to students and parents. Um, say state of Nebraska has safe to help. We have 988 which is sort of like the mental health version of 911. Um, how do we get people to understand how they can report and what you need? Um, what, what kinds of strategies have you all thought about? I mean, we're, we're doing better putting things out there, but do how do we help people figure that out? Lots and lots of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, we put tons and tons of effort into um, creating easy, accessible reporting systems, making sure that if someone bothers to take the time to report, they get some sort of an individualized, customized response. I love that when I shop on Amazon and I get a little notification that says, your package has been delivered. I'm like, no, it hasn't. Ding dong. I'm like, oh, here it is. Yay. Right. So I get immediate feedback that there has been action that's been taken on my behalf that I initiated. I get a, a return receipt when I make a report. I call someone and I get a return phone call within less than 24 hours. Right. So that if we are responsive on the other end, build it and they will come. Right. So the reporting strategies of a little bit here gets word of mouth out, gets trust built, and then all of a sudden our report numbers start skyrocketing. Lots and lots of marketing has been happening there. And it's not necessarily big flash posters. Right? It's, it's what we do. It's our own integrity in play. Is there a follow-up? Please, ma'am. Uh, so the tension I was really pointing to is between wanting people to report if, they, if you see something, but also the concern that a lot of us have watching um, some reports that seem misguided or lead to action against an individual that is, right? And so I think that is the hesitancy that people have. And so how do you counter that tension? You know, the number one thing that I would recommend there is not to have zero tolerance language in your policies. Ever. I know this is a strange response to that, but when we get this idea as administrators or politicians or people who are writing out expectations of infrastructure, and we say we have a zero tolerance for violence in our workplace, we have zero tolerance for students who misbehave, right? We have zero tolerance for um, acting out against our healthcare providers. That's not true. We tolerate things all the time. Right. So we've already undermined ourselves with a lack of credibility by saying something that we're not going to support. Right. So that's number one. And then number two, there's a lot of research out there around what does zero tolerance actually mean? So it might actually, and it's been shown to reduce reporting for the issues that you're talking about, that I don't want to get this kid expelled because I know that they really need to come to school because these are where they get their three meals every day. Right? I don't want to, to say anything about this employee and this really strange behavioral change I'm noticing that scares me because it, we have a zero tolerance policy and they'll get fired and then they won't have a job and then they'll come after me. So I better not say anything. So we don't want to trigger absolutely absurd outcomes for people. And the reason that some of those outcomes are triggered is because of the policies we ourselves write. It's our own darn fault. So if we can take a look at the real language that we put forward to people, instead say, your reports will be taken seriously and evaluated using evidence-based, data-driven practices on an individualized case-by-case -case basis, we take it seriously, we will do something, and we will get back to you, and we will tell you what we can, we will build trust, and we will not have the absurd outcomes that we get boxed in by our own ridiculous policies. Not that I have an opinion, mind you. 
right? But it's a great question. Absolutely. There are data that back that up. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, Lynn, uh, the point you make about trust, right? I think trust is the most critical component. Uh, so then the next question becomes, how do you build trust? And I think uh, Joe exemplifies um, ways that you can build trust, right? Uh, being transparent with the data uh, and maybe getting to see that when I do report this, according to his program, it's not about punishment. It's about supporting the student. And he's providing data in a transparent way that as a stakeholder, I'm looking at that, I'm seeing that, and now I can make an informed decision. Um, so I, I think those are great points. Uh, point that Lynn makes about trust, an example from Joe, and hopefully I didn't steal your thunder uh, regarding the answer, but uh, I think he exemplifies that. I, th I think, uh, especially for high school kids, they need to identify it as, as an upstander. And with pro-social marketing, that's hard to do with kids. I mean, there are, there are people here in the marketing department, I'm sure they can tell us how to do that. But I know that our principals who take uh, a personal effort to tell kids, you know, let's, if you have a concern, go to a trusted adult, use safe to say that's our, our app. But we can tell where those are coming from. And when you tell kids 100% um, of LPS students, like in public school students, feel they should be safe at school. They have the right to be safe at school. And then at East High, nine out of 10 Spartans, because now you're identifying, hey, I'm an East High Spartan. Nine out of 10 Spartans know how to use safe to say. So you're, you're getting kids to identify. I am a reporter, I am an upstander, and I will I know how to keep myself safe. And I think drilling into that with you know, a, a population that's migrating through high school every four years, it's a never ending effort. Uh, but that type of marketing to get people to personally identify with being an upstander is is the way to market, at least for kids. You know, one of the interesting things was that when you look at the data, we, we work with you on the Lincoln Public Schools data, even the kids who get in, who get in trouble for doing something rather significant, they're not getting expelled from school they may be temporarily excluded until they get services and those and I could count in one hand and still have plenty of room how many students that were but they get reintegrated back right you know I never call a kid my enemy sometimes their behavior is and and what's the saying keep your friends close your enemies closer I want those kids right in my programs I want a, a trusted adult with them every day someone who they identify as a mentor We've had a teammates program in place for a long, long time, and they pull a ton of data. And everything says that if a kid has three trusted adults in their life, you had a math teacher, uh, their history, I'm sorry, history, their chances of getting jammed up in the future in the criminal justice system, it's like dropping off a cliff. So if you can give a kid a second or third trusted adult, even if it's just someone who comes to spend an hour a week with them and not talk about anything other than you know, show me how to do this on my iPhone, something like that. Um, that that makes a tremendous difference. Sorry, Mario, can I piggyback on that really quick? Please. And this is me going back to my kids for 12 days. We had a particular school in our school district that had very little uh, concerning behaviors reports. And I thought there was an issue with the reporting. So I decided to go there and observe. And what I saw was every single teacher was doing hallway time meaning they were standing by the front door, doing eye contact with the students, greeting them, saying hello. And I'm seeing this interaction. And I saw that and it was very, very structured. It was really nicely done. That human connection before the kids are coming into to, to the classroom. And as they leave, the teachers are there again, greeting them, talking to them. Um, and then I decided, this is interesting. I went back to the school with the highest amount of threatening behaviors being reported. And I didn't see a single teacher in the hallway. I didn't see any teachers reading. So I, I, I of course, not enough sampling, but uh, it was very apparent that culturally speaking, that eye connection, that greeting uh, was inflicting change on the, culturally in the camps. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, another question that came in, are there, and Len, you talked a lot about protective factors. Are there specific protective factors that you have all found that, and, and protective factors is a jargon term, 
but the, the positive interventions that y'all have found to be helpful. So one of your own Nebraska sons, uh, Dr. Eric L. Bogan, uh, graduated out of uh, Dr. Sklora's program a day or two ago. Eric and I are within 16 